Let's start over. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. So good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Wednesday evening with the Clear Mountain Monastery community, and thank you for your patience. Uh, this evening we'll be going through a bit of a deeper dive into this chanting book, which is the chanting book that we use at um, Clear Mountain uh, when we're chanting together on Sundays, and there's a group of people on our Discord channel who are memorizing many of these chanting uh, chants and chanting them together on a regular basis, the chanting chums, as they call themselves. Uh, it's also the book which was originally put out. This new version is copyright 2015 by Amaravati Publications, um, typeset by our friend Ajahn Gambiro, a really beautiful book, and one which is really the beating heart of our various different monasteries. It uh, forms the uh, what we chant in the mornings and the evenings uh, every single day, basically, whether we're in a group or by ourselves. And thus, uh, it really becomes uh, imprinted on our hearts. And I thought, um, if we have time, uh, I might go a bit into uh, just how to approach the chanting book as a whole. And for people who are online, you can go, uh, there's a link in the description to where you can see the PDF. Um, but I'll also be doing screen sharing, so you can follow along as you'd like. But uh, more than just trying to give an overview of everything that uh, exists in this book, I thought to go deeply into the Anapana Sati Sutta. So uh, this is on page 85 of the chanting book, and I feel like it provides a good template for how to approach chanting as practice. So chanting practice as breathing practice, breathing practice as chanting practice, and using this Anapana Sati Sutta, the discourse on mindfulness of breathing, as a guide for aligning the mind while chanting. Uh, it's quite fascinating how, how well that works. So as usual, people can uh, write questions in in the chat, and uh, we'll get to those at about 6.30. Um, and feel free to put those in any time. Um, and let's just jump right into that, that discourse. So if you go to the PDF, it has this nice uh, bar over here on the side. And we can go to Teachings on Mindfulness of Breathing. And I'll be chanting it and just giving some, uh, some notes about the way that the uh, the chanting book is formatted, and also ways that we can take the teachings in this sutta into our chanting practice as a whole. So I would recommend um, when you're picking up any chanting book uh, to look at the chanting guide. Um, and I won't uh, spend much time on that now unless we have time at the end. Uh, but there's this is a really important um, just two pages to look at. And it exists in most chanting books. It exists in the Dhammayut chanting book of Wat Metta, um, pretty much any chanting book for uh, people who are coming to Buddhism anew. It will give you insights or basically instructions on how to uh, pronounce different letters, like the A with this line over the top. The macron is pronounced about twice as long as the short. So a, a, e, e, u, u, a, o, and then several other um, important concepts, which you should really uh, spend some time in memorizing. And I won't go into those 
uh, tonight just because there are other videos on YouTube where people go into all of the nuances and important nuances of pronouncing Pali. Um, and it's good to get that knowledge in in the beginning so you get good habits from the start. Um, but really, if you're just paying attention, so that's a big part of chanting is just uh, paying attention to how the people around you are chanting. It's a Sangha Anusati, a recollection of uh, the Sangha, the people around you. How are they chanting? How loud are they chanting? And you don't want to uh, chant so loud that you can't hear the person next to you or so soft that you can't even hear yourself. So there's some good principles. So I would recommend spending time on this polyphonetics and pronunciation. But you'll just uh, hopefully pick it up if you just uh, pay attention to what other people are doing. So in this book, each chant starts off with these bracketed phrases. And what that is, is for the lead chanter. Um, so at our monasteries, uh, we have someone who will read this first line, and that kind of starts the, sets the pitch and sets the tone, uh, and then people can follow along after that. So, Andamayang Hanapana Sati Sutta Patang Banamase. And as you'll see here, um, we've got these up arrows and down arrows. Um, so, Pali is not a tonal language, unlike Thai, unlike Chinese. Um, but to pronounce Pali in Thai, um, just based on the tonal tones of Thai, there it's pronounced with tones in uh, when one is chanting, a Thai person is chanting Pali, it comes out tonal. In this um, Western or this is called Roman script. When this Roman script is being uh, chanted, it, uh, when the book was being put together, these arrows were meant to um, somewhat mirror how it's done in Thailand because this is from the Ajahn Cha lineage and is based on the Thai pronunciation. So in Thai, it would be like, Han Tamayang Anapana Sati. Um, and the arrows roughly, uh, roughly go with that. So we have here, as in many chanting books, a mix of Pali and English, which is uh, really helpful because you start to learn the words, which is quite helpful because then you see the hyperlinked nature of these texts. The Buddha would say one word here and it would, as we'll see, uh, link up to words which he uses in other discourses. So... Anapana sati bhikave bhavita bahuli kata. Bhikkhus, when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, mahapalahoti mahani sangsa, it is of great fruit and great benefit. So, uh, something else I'll be trying to do with this uh, is really, I think we can take. Um, Any time when it says anapana sati, sati is mindfulness, ana is the in-breath, and apana is the out-breath. So mindfulness of the in-breath and the out-breath. Um, we can take the word chanting um, as a filler there. So bhikkhus, when mindfulness of chanting is developed and cultivated, or just when chanting is developed and cultivated, it is of great fruit and great benefit because really chanting is just breathing with your mouth open and intoning. So this whole practice of breath meditation really perfectly dovetails it more than dovetails. It's just uh, perfectly aligned with um, chanting is, is aligned with, with the breath and you'll see how that works as we go along. Anapana sati bhikave bhavita bahuli kata. When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, jataro sati patane paripureti. It fulfills the four foundations of mindfulness. Again, this is um, part of that hyperlinked, um, like Wikipedia esque nature of the suttas. 
So here we don't have an asterisk. The Buddha doesn't stop in the middle of this discourse, um, which is, uh, by the way, Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 118. This is a, a summary or kind of the heart essence, the heart of that sutta. The actual discourse in the Majjhima is uh, much longer, but this is a condensation, the main 16 steps in the introduction to that. But he doesn't stop and define what are the four foundations of mindfulness. But we will find that in um, other places, even in this chanting book. So um, in the, the teaching on the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, we find there a definition of what is right mindfulness. It's knowing the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Uh, knowing feelings in and of themselves, knowing the mind in and of itself, knowing dhammas in and of themselves, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. So yeah, we have the Buddha kind of creating this web, this interconnected web and network of meaning, which is just fascinating. And the more you practice chanting, the more you go into the suttas, um, the more you kind of live these teachings, uh, the chants constellate around your being. It almost becomes as if you're living inside of a um, uh, a chakra or a um, yeah, kind of a mind palace. You've created this constellation of meanings. So um, this dovetails with a really important point, um, which is for me um, the condensed essence of why chanting is a useful practice. And this is a quote from Majjhima Nikaya number 19, the two sorts of thoughts, Dvaita Vitaka. So whatever a person frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of their mind. So yeah, that's why we chant in the morning and in the evening. And if you've got a mantra practice just throughout the day, all the time, just constantly chanting because it's a way of actively training the mind actively putting the mind on an object so as to get the mind to stay in this groove. So I think before, um, <laughs> when I was still muted at the beginning, uh, I mentioned three different markings that the Buddha spoke of. So it's like you've got a marking through water. So if you take your finger and run it through, um, say, a pool of water, the line that you created is pretty much gone as soon as you put your finger through. Then you have markings on sand. So you dip your finger into sand and it's there for a while, but basically just not even a day because as soon as high tide comes, it just washes the sand away. And then you have etchings on stone. And yeah, I mean, it'll take a long time for water to wear away uh, things which have been engraved on stone. So, so it is with these teachings. If you've been reciting something every morning and every evening, um, yeah, I mean, we do this all the time, even before we come to Buddhism, even before we come to Dharma practice, even before we become interested in training the mind. Um, we are basically telling ourselves we've got these earworms, whether it's a, a pop song or uh, whatever it is that we're just kind of humming away to ourselves or the gears that are just turning away internally. Uh, we're doing, we're frequently thinking and pondering on something all the time. And it's just when we come to practice that we realize that we're doing that and can become more intentional with that. And that's what these, these chants are. That's what this whole chanting book is about. So as a brief aside, but yeah, consider your chanting practice in just this way. You're inclining the mind towards these wholesome teachings. These are the constellation. These are the handful of leaves that the Buddha said, uh, he taught because they lead to uh, dispassion. They lead to uh, peace, coolness, and eventually to Nibbana. So that's cool. All right, we'll keep chanting. So chattaro satipatana bhavita bahulikata. When the four foundations of mindfulness are developed and cultivated, sata bojange paripurinti. They fulfill the seven factors of awakening. Sata bojanga bhavita bahulikata. 
when the seven factors of awakening are developed and cultivated, vija vimuting paripurinti, they fulfill true knowledge and deliverance. So like the four foundations of mindfulness, we're introduced to another um, constellation of meaning, this other uh, set of teachings that the Buddha spoke about again and again. Um, and that's the seven factors of awakening. So the four foundations of mindfulness are can be seen as the superstructure within which the 16 steps, which we'll get to in the next pages, uh, fit into the first four ways of breathing, uh, fit into um, uh, the body, the next four go into feelings, the next four go into mind, and the next four go into dhammas. Um, the seven factors of awakening are mindfulness, which we can bring to our chanting, uh, dhamma vichya, which is recollection, recollection of dhamma, which is exactly what chanting in its uh, purest form and in its real form is. Uh, you've got energy, which we're practicing while we're chanting. Uh, it's joy, which we'll see is something that we train in, in the, I believe it's the fifth step, is breathing in, uh, I will breathe in, uh, encouraging joy, encouraging piti. Then you've got tranquility, pasadi, you've got samadhi, concentration, and upeka, or equanimity. So those are the seven factors of awakening. And that's what we can balance in our, uh, in our chanting. Um, if things, if our chanting and our mind is a bit dull, we can highlight the more energetic qualities of investigation and of energy and of joy. And if our chanting is rather um, to our minds are rather anxious and uh, we're feeling a bit uh, flighty and flitty, then we can focus more on the calming qualities, the calming factors of awakening of tranquility and samadhi and equanimity. Katang bhavita chapi kave anapana sati katang bahuli kata. And how bhikkhus is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated, mahapalahoti mahani samsa, so that it is of great fruit and great benefit. Ida bhikkhave bhikkhu, here bhikkhus a bhikkhu, aranya gatoa, gone to the forest, rukamula gatoa, to the foot of a tree. Sunyagara gatoa, or to an empty hut. So here we have uh, repetition, which is something which you find a lot in the suttas and a lot in the chanting. Um, that chant we did right at the beginning, the Namo Tassa, I, I believe it appears in different forms um, five or six times in the chanting book. Um, this, again, this phrase, um, mindfulness of breathing when developed and cultivated is of great fruit and great benefit. That's already been repeated once just on the previous page. Uh, but again, this is we're making water or making lines in the sand of our mind. We're training the mind to incline in a certain more dhammic direction. And we can chant. We can do this practice of breathing, this practice of chanting with the mouth open, uh, <laughs> of breathing with the mouth open and vocalizing in a forest, at the foot of a tree, empty hut, or with others, and bringing this quality of a, an empty mind to our, our chanting. Nisi dati palankanga bujitava Sits down, having crossed his legs. Ujumkayang panidaya parimukang sating upatapetava Sets his body erect, having established mindfulness in front of him. So satova asasati, satova pasasati, ever mindful he breathes in, mindful he breathes out. So a number of good principles here for chanting. So sitting down, um, uh, yeah, palankang is, um, it means crossing the legs. Uh, but basically, if you go to a monastery uh, or when you're by yourself, you can chant in whatever posture is comfortable. If you're visiting a monastery, you'll see what all the other practitioners do, and you can just try to copy that. In Thailand, it's traditional to sit on our knees um, with our buttock on our heels, and then just chanting with our hands up in Anjali. So 
Ujung Kayang Panidaya, setting the body erect. So that's an important aspect of chanting is to have this upright posture. This, um, yeah, this is something which people are taught just in singing classes, just to have, if you have an upright posture, your lungs are expanded as much as they can be. And that helps the sound. And it also helps with mindfulness of the body, as we'll see. Parimukang sating upattapetava. Upattapetava, having cause sati, mindfulness, to be established. Parimukang. So pari, like the parameter, is around. The muka can mean either the mouth or the face. And this is interpreted in different ways. Um, but in my experience, the Buddha was... Uh, being quite broad. He could have been very specific and define this as parimukhan just means the tip of the nose, which is what they take in certain meditation and traditions, but um, yeah, or just around the face or around the face this way, um, or just to the fore in front of them is how it's trans translated here. So bringing mindfulness to the front. And again, um, if you're chanting, you can actually uh, bring mindfulness to the uh, the organ of the mouth, to the tongue, which is fascinating, and you'll become uh, more sensitive to the the movements of the tongue as you as you trans uh, you learn Pali more and more, and as you chant more and more. Ever mindful, one breathes in, and mindful, one breathes out. Ever mindful, one chants in and out, chanting in and out. Digang va asa santo, digang asa samiti pachanati. Breathing in long, he knows I breathe in long. Digang va pasa santo, digang pasa samiti pachanati. Breathing out long, he knows I breathe out long. Rasam va asa santo, rasam asa samiti pachanati. Breathing in short, he knows I breathe in short. Rasam va pasa santo, rasam pasa samiti pajanati. Breathing out short, he knows I breathe out short. So this is something you can do as you're chanting. You'll realize that pretty much most of the time you're chanting, it's these long out breaths and then interspersed with short in breaths. So you can be aware of the breath in that way as you're chanting. Uh, but actually I find these next, those are the first two steps. I find the next two steps uh, more helpful for mindfulness of breathing because it expands the awareness to the whole body. Sabakaya pati sang vedi asasi samiti sikati. He trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body. Sabakaya pati sang vedi pasasi samiti sikati. He trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing the whole body. Pasam bhayang kaya sankara asasi samiti sikati. He trains thus, I shall breathe in tranquilizing the bodily formations. Pasam bhayang kaya sankara Pasasi samiti sikati. He trains thus, I shall be thou tranquilizing the bodily formations. So these are the steps three and four of the 16 steps of breath meditation. And here we're bringing our awareness as we're doing breath meditation or as we're doing our chanting to the whole body. And a very useful concept which Bhante Analio introduces is uh, the concept of foregrounding and backgrounding attention. So this is the discourse on mindfulness of breathing. So mindfulness of breathing is always, when we're practicing this way, in the foreground or the background. The first two steps, knowing in-breath short or long, out-breath short or long, that's foregrounding the breath. But here, we can say that we're foregrounding our awareness of the whole body and backgrounding our awareness of the breath. And I feel you can do this with chanting as well. You can foreground um, whatever aspect of the chanting you're doing and background the uh, awareness of the whole body or awareness of the breath. So for instance, um, yeah, it's you can't really give, um, or it's not 
usually helpful to give just um, black and white instructions and think that's going to work for everybody. Uh, the power of chance lies in their uh, repetition. And if you're going to be doing this for a long time, uh, perhaps you know multiple times a day, every day, um, you have to have a practice which has some can have some longevity to it and have some creativity that's built into its processes. So yeah, experience what it's like. It might be like to focus on the body, have a full awareness of the full body and to relax that, to bring, to tranquilize the bodily formations, which is basically either the breath or the body as a whole, relaxing all the musculature as, as a background awareness, the whole time you're chanting and then foregrounding an awareness of what you're actually chanting, the meaning of that. So the meaning, okay, experiencing the whole body. I'm actually thinking about what that is. Um, whatever one thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of their mind. So there is a place for thinking, even while you're chanting, to some degree. And again, um, the subtler and simpler we can keep that, the better. Um, but yes, yeah, some measure of focusing on the meaning, perhaps foreground it, and then a background awareness of the whole body and tranquilizing that. And time is running out before we go to questions. So I'll just read the next steps in English. So this is steps five through 16. Um, so one trains thus, and again, the gender here is not important. When the Buddha was teaching bhikkhunis, he would use she. Um, and again, with these words, it's non-gendered. The uh, verb is non-gendered. So one trains thus, I shall breathe in, I shall breathe out, experiencing rapture or pity. One trains thus, I shall breathe in, I shall breathe out, experiencing pleasure or happiness, sukha. One trains thus, I shall breathe in, I shall breathe out, experiencing the mental formations. One trains thus, I shall breathe in, I shall breathe out, tranquilizing the mental formations. Uh, and these uh, chitta sankharas can be thought of as like the cloud formations of the mind. Whereas the next step, one trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing the mind, I shall breathe out experiencing the mind. That's the whole sky. And the mental formations are the clouds. Uh, that's my way of practicing with it. So I shall breathe in, I shall breathe out, gladdening the mind. And again, one trains thus. This is a, an active training. You're turning attention that quote about whatever one thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination. This inclination, the nutty, the bending of the mind, that's what's what's being uh, inclined to here with this word, sickety, one trains. I shall breathe out, gladdening the mind. Uh, and that's uh, a real benefit of chanting, especially when you do it with others, but even when you do it by yourself. One trains thus, I shall breathe in, I shall breathe out, concentrating the mind. One trains thus, I shall breathe in, I shall breathe out, liberating the mind. One trains thus, I shall breathe in, I shall breathe out, contemplating impermanence. One trains thus, I shall breathe in, I shall breathe out, contemplating the fading away of passions, uh, viraga. One trains thus, I shall breathe in, I shall breathe out, contemplating cessation, niroda. And one trains thus, I shall breathe in, I shall breathe out, contemplating relinquishment or patinisaga. So that was a bit of a whirlwind through the uh, discourse, the chanting of the teaching on mindfulness of breathing. And uh, there really is a lot there. And I would invite everyone just to experiment with um, bringing these principles of breath meditation, uh, these principles of foregrounding awareness and backgrounding awareness to your practice of chanting. It can be a practice that enlivens the mind, that gladdens the mind, that brings joy, that brings piti, that brings sukha or happiness. So explore with that and don't just, um, yeah, it, it's easy to our, I think we have a Western, uh, maybe perhaps a modern bias towards novelty, it's called novelty bias, where we're just hooked on this constant 24 hour, I think there's some commentators which call it the ever present now, which is basically this you know, constant newsreel of everything fresh and new. Uh, so you read suttas, you read these chanting books, and you, um, yeah, it's just, what's up with this rote, repetitive, over-repetitive chanting? It's just not interested. Give me something fresh. Give me something new. Um, and there is a place for novelty. You certainly need it in a, a life. Uh, different people need more or less of it, but also a measure of consistency, this through line. And that's what a 
sutta is. The word sutta literally means a thread. This is a thread of our lives. The Thai word for to chant is swat mon. The word swat comes from old Khmer, which comes from the Sanskrit uh, sutra or a thread. So this is a thread or a sutta of mon or a mantra, swat mon, the uh, sutra of repetition. So that's what our chanting can be. So yeah, now can be a time for questions so, or comments. Please feel free to put those in the comments. All right. Ajahn, I see on page 138 uh, that the pronunciation of V is softer than the English V near W. Typically pronounce it as a W. Uh, could you show your pronunciation? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, it's a good point. And um, va, va, uh, vandana, 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 vandana. So it doesn't have the uh, the sharp va, va, va. You're not uh, you're pulling your lower lip in va, va, vand, or you're pulling it in less van, vandana, uh, or uh, vadami, vat, vatati. Um, so, yeah, and I believe uh, people in Sri Lanka who speak Sinhalese and uh, people from India, this is, um, yeah, just a natural way to pronounce uh, Vs. In Thailand, there's just no V sound, so it's pronounced as basically a pure W. So, uh, vata sangsan, the vata sangsara, is with a, just a W. So the Indic way that the Buddha would have been pronouncing it likely is closer to how it's pronounced in Sri Lanka or in Northern India, even still today. So yeah, good point. Thank you. All right, Vandana, yeah, whose name I just kept saying, which literally means uh, Vandana is like um, reverencing. Um, so beautiful name. Uh, Ajahn's pronunciation is very close to the Indian. That's very kind. That's very kind. I am um, in my Pali class. I have intentionally tried to do that, but I personally feel like I have a long way to go. Um, all right. So comment. So the process of rapture, bliss, and joy happens naturally with mindfulness of breathing. That's a very good point. And so rapture is piti. Um, yeah. So it depends on what um, words you're using um, for the Pali, uh, but you make a good point. Yes, rapture, bliss, and joy are natural processes of mindfulness of breathing. Um, there's another sutta, which I'll bring you to, um, which is, this is on Nikaya, book 5, 26. Um, and um, this is where the Buddha talks about five vimuti ayatanas, basis for liberation. And the fifth basis for liberation is concentration. But the first four are things related to study or listening. The first one is uh, basically just listening to a teaching. One feels inspired and that brings gives rise to joy or pamoja. Being joyful or having pam, uh, pamoja or pamuda uh, rapture or piti arises. When the mind is full of rapture, then the body becomes tranquil. Pasambaya or pasadi, which is another one of the factors of awakening. When the body is tranquil, one feels bliss or sukha. And uh, when one is blissful, the mind becomes immersed in samadhi. Sukhino chitang samadhi So sukha leading to samadhi. So that's based on listening. The next vimuti ayatana basis of liberation is um, when one is listening. Uh, yeah, when teaching, so listening or speaking the Dhamma, you can become inspired with what you're saying, and that will lead to um, uh, yeah, joy or well-being, which leads to piti or joy, which leads to uh, tranquility and samadhi. The next one is reciting. So this is where chanting comes in. Um, when one recites the teaching in details, they have learned and memorized it, then they become inspired by the meaning in the teaching. And then that leads to well-being, joy, tranquility, uh, sukha, and to samadhi. And the next one is, and then when the 
person thinks about and considers the teaching in their heart, examining it with the mind as they've learned and memorize it, that can lead to uh, this inspiration in the meaning and et cetera. So yeah, it's a good point. Um, these teachings really uh, play very nicely off of each other. The seven factors of awakening fit beautifully into that cascade of well-being, um, that well-being cascade, um, and they fit well into the jhana factors. PT and sukha are both jhana factors. So yeah, it's a, a great point. So can one read or say aloud the chant and still be effective? Um, yes. Yeah, so um, in a Theravada context, um, the chants, especially in this book, in the way that we chant it in the Western monasteries, um, it's really not seen as like a book of incantations or spells or, or magic. Um, there are Buddhist traditions that like go heavy and go big into mantras. Um, you know, you have quite long mantras that take 25 minutes to read, which are virtually unintelligible to most modern day speakers of uh, these other languages or even of Sanskrit, it's somewhat unintelligible. Um, but with these books, yeah, the pronunciation isn't really what's um, where the effect, where the, the potency lies. Um, you potentize the chanting yourself by how you're directing the mind. So however you're doing it, um, if it's giving rise to, uh, if you're able to bring in the chanting into these different channels of that are leading to well-being and joy, and um, happiness, then yeah, you can just say it out loud, read it. You can do the different intonations like I was doing or like they do in monasteries or just say it silently. All of it is effective. Let's see, could I just ask, although these days I can calm and quieter my mind down relatively easily in meditation after practicing for years, to be honest, despite some pity, that's the joy and I think this is sukha or uh, happiness, et cetera, arising. I always end up simply getting bored sooner or later. Any tips? Um, yeah. So there's a really important aspect of meditation and a longevity of a meditative life, which is interest. So the Pali word can be chanda, can be a word for interest, which is one of the factors for uh, concentration, or even sadha, which is usually translated as confidence or even faith, just taking that as interest. And um, there's huge benefit in meditation retreats. You go to a three-day retreat, a seven-day retreat, a 10-day retreat, and you learn a very specific technique. Okay, pay attention to the breath right here, going in and out, going in and out for 10 hours a day for three days straight. Then pay attention to you know some very particular way of focusing the mind for another seven days, um, et cetera. Uh, and that's great, You, but when you bring these techniques into your life, you have to find out a way to make them alive. And so experimenting, allowing some level of experimentation. If you read the writings of Ajahn Lee, who is a forest meditation Ajahn, or of uh, Ajahn Tanisaro, who is a American meditation teacher who has a monastery in Southern California, their writings are just filled with creativity. Uh, I lived at Wat Metta for a year and a half and basically Every day, it seems, Ajahn Jeff is coming up with new creative ways to work with the breath. So, yeah, balancing um, respect for a technique. And you don't want to get wishy-washy, but you do want a vitality. You want a zest. That's another word is energy or virya, bringing this aliveness, this zest, this interest, this chanda, uh, this, yeah, um, kind of upwelling of emotion to the process. And that's what um, the this factor of one trains thus, I will breathe in, gladdening the mind. So learning how to do that, and um, you can do it particular ways of paying attention to the physical breath coming in and out, or um, just by thinking about inspiring subjects. So hope that helped. Uh, Ajahn, sometimes PT or joy in step five of the uh, mindfulness of breathing chant is difficult to experience. So I jump to Chit Anupasana or Dhamma Anupasana. That's the steps, uh, I guess, nine through 12, and then 
13 through 16, uh, recollection or observation, anupassana of the mind, the citta, or the dhamma anupassana, recollection or uh, contemplation, watching of dhammas or phenomenon. Those citta anupassana, dhamma anupassana are the uh, third and fourth of the satipatthanas, which are uh, coded into that um, the beginning of that mindfulness of breathing. Um, that's totally fine. Um, yeah, some people believe that these 16 steps have to be progressive. You start with, you're just breathing in long and then you know the whole body and then then you go to piti and then you go to sukha and you shouldn't jump ahead. But in my experience, there's totally a place for, yeah, it, you're not cheating. You know, it's not like if you see anicca, which is step number 13, and rec rec recollecting, watching anicca, if you see impermanence, you know, while you're watching the short breath towards the beginning, you haven't, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. So yeah, I'm similar to you. Um, the zone of Chittanupasana is uh, a place where I like to stay in. And that Chittanupasana really can be an umbrella for uh, all of the other steps in a way. So yeah, totally, totally okay. Unfortunately, we're only gonna have time for one other question. Um, before we go to Zoom, but Ajahn, can chanting be done when con when completing ordinary tasks, or is that disrespectful? Yeah, um, no, I mean, disrespect lies in your heart, so respect or disrespect um, is totally an internal matter. Um, if you're living with other people, um, people might perceive what you're doing to be respectful or, or disrespectful, in which case you might want to maybe chant more softly. Um, but just if you're by yourself and you don't feel as disrespectful, it's a way to keep contemplating the Dhamma. I do that a lot. Usually for me, it's more mantra that I do while I'm uh, doing an ordinary task, something shorter, like like Budo or Budang Saranangachami, Dhammang Saranangachami, Sangang Saranangachami, then a longer chant because that's just easier to do while I'm doing something else. But yeah, no, it doesn't have to be disrespectful at all. Um, and yeah, I would almost guess that um, if you're wanting to do it, then it's not going to be disrespectful. So yeah, sadhu, that means awesome, way to go. So um, that's the end of the time here on uh, YouTube, but we will be switching over to our Zoom room and anyone who's able to can go over there. I'm gonna put the uh, link in the chat and um, yeah, people can go over there and we'll have a more interactive conversation, uh, which is always really wonderful. Uh, Ajahn Nispo is still on retreat for, I believe, two more weeks, um, but he's still going in for alms most days, but always look at the calendar. Some days he, he doesn't go, um, but check out the alms calendar and he will be going to the Saturday teachings as usual, which start at 9.30 at St. Mark's Cathedral in Seattle. So thank you. Uh, I wish all of you could have been here with me. I wish um, we could have all been together. Uh, chanting can be really powerful when it's done in a group setting. So maybe someday we can all do that together. That'd be wonderful. So until then, I wish you all the best and hopefully see some of you over on Zoom. All right, take care.